chapter 28 tonight. If you don't have a Bible, a copy of the Scripture with you, uh, there are the black book under the chair racks. And if you see anybody looking around like they can't find a Bible because there isn't one near them, help them out. And uh, you can even turn to Matthew chapter 28 uh, for them. And we're going to go where most people go when they go to Matthew chapter 28, and right to the end of, of the... Um, of the gospel letter there, the end of the chapter, and we'll begin reading tonight in verse 16, when you found it. Don't you love it when the preacher says, when you found it, look up this way, and then you look up and he starts reading, and you just lost your place because you looked up? All right, so don't look up. All right, don't don't fall for that one. Uh, preachers always trick you that way. You ever notice that? Yeah, they do that. It's tricky. It's like once you found your place, look up. Well, then you lost your place. All right, verse 16. <laughs> Then the eleven apostles or disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Father, I pray that you would help us with our understanding this evening as we uh, go to the Scripture, as we just look at simple, practical truth. And God, I pray that you would bring us all back to a place, a basic place, where we would evaluate and ask ourselves, are we doing the simple things? Are we as believers involved with your plan? For our lives, and I pray that you just give clarity to the preaching of your word tonight. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I think most of us have memorized Acts, or Acts, <laughs> memorized Matthew chapter 28, and uh, most of these last scriptures. Most people have memorized Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, uh, teaching them, or go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I've commanded you, and though I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. I actually like uh, uh, Luke's gospel account of the last words of Jesus here as well, because he gives detail about how that uh, Jesus had told the disciples to return to Jerusalem. He talked about how they returned to Jerusalem with joy. And this is right after Jesus had ascended up to heaven. Now I just want to begin this evening by reminding us about a couple of simple things, basic things. And as believers, I think getting back to the basics sometimes is what we need. What's the matter? What are we pointing at? Oh, Anthony's out. You want me to throw something at him? All right. Hold on. <laughs> if you don't wake him up. So, just a second. Oh, I missed. All right. Let's try a better one. Oh, he's awake. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I think I think sometimes as believers we need to get ourselves back, take ourselves back to the basics. Here's one. Here's one that's basic, right? Remember the joy of your salvation. I love it when David was out of fellowship with God and he asked God, "Restore to me the joy of my salvation." You remember that your first come to know Jesus as your Savior, and you recognize for the first time that you no longer carry guilt. I'm not a major fan of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. I think it's a great work. Uh, but one of the things that I love is the illustration that he uses of the burden that he carried. And the more ways he tried to get his burden off him, the heavier his burden was. And that, that is what it is when you realize that you're a sinner and that sin is a big deal to God, isn't it? You know, you realize, okay, so God is justifiably my enemy. He's against me. And that's tough. And uh, then you try to do things. And you realize that you can never be good enough for a perfect God. Can you? Could you ever do enough uh, to be good enough to be in fellowship with a perfect God? Uh, it, it's impossible, but, but assuming a person could stop doing evil and do only good for the remainder of their lives, you'd never be good enough for God. you never measure up to God. And, uh, man, when you realize that God's expectation for sinners is not that we're good, isn't that we stop sinning and measure up, but that His expectation for sinners is that He's willing to <coughs> judge His Son in their place and give eternal life, free gift of eternal life to them. And that all He wants is for them to turn to Him in faith and receive 
the work of the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And when you do that, and just like the Bible talks about, you know, uh, when in 1 John chapter 5, when you believe in, in the Lord Jesus, then the, the he that believeth hath the witness in himself. God's Spirit comes in you. Comes and lives in you and, and shows you that you're God's child. And now you're not guilty. You no longer have a burden. It's been lifted. You're forgiven. And not only that, but you have a Heavenly Father who expressly commands you, ask me. <laughs> I just love it. He asks anything according to His will. He heareth us. And if we know that He hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Every time I have the privilege of leading someone to Jesus and they pray and ask God to, to save them, I try to just share with them 1 John chapter 5. Not only this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us, but we know, and we know that if He hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. And I tell people, ask God for something you know that He wants, that you know only God could do. And don't tell anybody about it. You know, some Christians kind of hedge their prayers, you know. They pray for finances, you know, I can't pay a bill. And so they post it out on Facebook with all their Christian friends. Pray for me, I can't afford this such and so, and you really need help. And, you know, pray my GoFundMe works or something like that. You know, they're not relying on God, they're relying on someone, right? Sometimes when we share prayer requests of needs, don't we some, aren't we sometimes hoping that somebody that hears the need, well, God will impress them to, no, I want God to impress them without me saying anything if that's what God's going to do. Mm -hmm. And so tell only God about it. Don't tell anyone else. And ask God for something. And my friend, when God answers your prayer, you'll know that you and God have got something. Like you have a relationship with God, and it isn't someone else's, it's your own. Man, isn't that thrilling? Isn't it thrilling to know that your sins are forgiven? Isn't it thrilling to know that you have a relationship with God and it's your own? And that's pretty basic in the Christian life. As we grow in the faith, sometimes I think we get away from those basic things that still are supposed to be every bit as much, every bit as much, a part of our, uh, of our service to the Lord, of our living for the Lord, of our experience with God as they ever were. Sometimes it's good for us to get back to the basic things and remember the basic things. Matthew chapter 28 is a basic command of the Scripture. This is the last words that Jesus left with His disciples before He ascended up to heaven. Now, previous to this, of course, according to Acts, uh, and, or according to 1 Corinthians, according to Acts, He's shown Himself alive uh, by many infallible proofs being seen within 40 days. So the resurrected Jesus was with His disciples for 40 days teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. If you were uh, to read uh, if you were to read about Paul's account, Paul said that Jesus was seen of the 12 disciples like we see here in the gospel and that he was seen of above uh, 500 witnesses the, of whom were alive up to this present. And then he said the word of God says that Jesus Christ is risen. And he said as well as the witness of the word of God, he said I saw the resurrected Jesus. In other words, Jesus was seen among witnesses. And I just think, going back to Matthew 28 and verses 16 uh, through 20, reminds us that this is not, we're not a part of some dead religion. We serve a risen Savior who is alive forevermore. He'll never die again. And when He died, He only died uh, for our sins, but God raised Him up. And we are risen with Christ. And it's a wonderful thing to be reminded of that basic truth of the Scripture. But then I want to begin uh, this evening, I just want to focus on the commands that Jesus gave after He said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He said in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. You know the, who the most influential person, this is a trick question, so think about it, who the most influential person uh, in the lost world, that is, unbelieving world, that people that don't believe in Jesus. You know who the most influential person in the world is for unbelieving people? It's a trick question. Okay, yeah, no, no, wrong answer. Yeah. Jesus is. Yeah, that's the right answer. Most influential person in the world is Jesus Christ. 
a lost person would agree with that, wouldn't they? Many atheists have acknowledged said, you know what? They hate the influence that Jesus has on the world. Isn't it incredible <laughs> the influence that Jesus Christ has had? Even a person that doesn't believe in Jesus, their world has literally been completely influenced by Jesus Christ. You remember what the unbelieving council uh, that brought in Peter and John in Acts, remember what they said about the apostles? They said they've turned the world upside down. Turned the world upside down. There has never been anybody as influential or nearly closely to as influential as the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about for unbelievers. Now, who's the most influential person in the world for believers? Well, the same, obviously, Jesus Christ is. Now, when Jesus ascended up to heaven, He said, after that, He talked about the power. He said, uh, all power is given unto Me in heaven and in earth. If you study what Jesus told His apostles before He went to the cross, He told them that greater works than He did, greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto My Father. And that actually was true. Uh, we were talking about greatness a little bit this uh, yesterday with the Sunday school class. But I want to remind you about greatness. Uh, it's a perspective thing, actually, isn't it? How many of y'all are impressed by the fact that Jesus walked on water? How many of y'all? That's impressive. I am too. Anybody impressed that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead after being four years in the grave? I'm impressed by that. Uh, anybody impressed by healing lepers? I am. Giving blind their sight, healing the deaf, casting out devils. We're impressed with all those things, aren't we? Is God impressed? <laughs> God's never been impressed by a miracle. The reason we're impressed is because it's something we cannot do. But everything that God does uh, that impresses us, <coughs> it's not at all impressive. At all. I mean, it's in His character and nature. He's not limited. Not, there's no miracle for God. God doesn't say, wow, that's a miracle. It's amazing. That's I don't understand it. I can't believe it. Miracles don't impress God. But Jesus told the disciples, He said, greater works than these, the miracles, the things He done, shall you do because I go unto my Father. And do you realize that the apostles preached a gospel that turned the world upside down and that impressed God? Do you know that the fullness of power a believer preaching the gospel and serving God in the fullness of power impresses God? Uh, did you know that being a servant impresses God? He talked about greatness with the disciples. You remember that? He that will be uh, chief among you, let him be your servant, and he will be the greatest, let him be the servant of all. Uh, there are things that impress God, but, it, but they're not things that are miraculous, not things that are impossible, humanly speaking. God's impressed by some things. And you know, we have to be careful about a false sense of piety or humility as believers. Sometimes we think, well, you know what, I don't want to be great because I don't want people to look at me and I don't want to try to achieve greatness. You know, that's nonsense. You and I ought not to want to be great in the world's eyes, but we ought to want to do great things for God. We ought to want to accomplish the will of God in the greatest way possible. Isn't that so? You know, sometimes we as believers, we, don't, we forget what we're to strive for. And the question this evening is, if I'm going to do great things for God, what would I do? And the answer is in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Okay, so what, what do we teach all nations? Well, the gospel, evidently. The resurrection, right? We tell people that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And the reason He died was because all have sinned. It comes short of the glory of God. He died for our sin. Jesus did not die because of His own sin. He died because He was crucified for our sin. And God laid our sin on Him. Jesus was buried. He was in the grave for three days. But then He rose again from the dead. And through His resurrection, you and I are able to be resurrected. We're able to have life. Just like we're buried with Him in baptism unto death, according to Romans 6, we're raised with Him to walk in newness of life. And so, that's a miracle, but that's the message that we're supposed to teach all nations. Now, I want to look at two things, practically speaking, and all of us need to get this, so if you're not paying attention now, this may be for you. Matter of fact, I know for some of us here, uh, the matter of baptism is the next step in your uh, the next step in your faith. 
And so Jesus said, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I want to look at that real quickly. If you're in Matthew, could you turn past the Gospels? You'll go past Mark, Luke, and John, and then you'd be right in Acts. And I'd like to go to Acts chapter 2, and maybe just look at a couple verses in Acts about baptism. We see uh, the, the apostles, the first thing they did after the power of the Holy Ghost came on them was that they preached the Gospel. And they preached it to the very individuals that were responsible and complicit with, with uh, crucifying Lord Jesus. Go down to verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, if you found Acts 2. This is the response after, after uh, Peter had preached the Gospel to them just like he was commanded to. He says, uh, Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to do what Jesus said. And Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the, and ye shall receive, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And uh, verse 41, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now we'll pause there, because I want to talk about baptism just for a minute. Uh, when is a believer to be baptized? Well, when he's believed. When he's received Jesus as his Savior. So we are to preach the gospel, and then when we've preached the gospel, we're to baptize believers. What's baptism? Well, it's a word that in our language has its own meaning. In other words, there isn't necessarily a synonym. The closest thing that we have in the English language that is a synonym for baptism is dip. In other words, to dip or to dunk. Uh, and that literally is just baptized means to be, to be immersed by or covered by. And so we don't have a single word that means exactly what baptism does because the bat word baptism isn't just something you do to somebody. It carries with it the idea of being immersed with or involved with, completely involved with something. So if somebody's baptized in the name of Jesus, they're a Christ follower. They're a believer in Jesus. They are uh, they're an imitator of Jesus. So it's more than just, well, we baptize them in the water. No, we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. In other words, there's an identification with Jesus Christ that is openly showed forth with baptism. When should a person be baptized? Well, after you believe. And so you teach people, and then you baptize them, teach them the gospel, then baptize them when they believe. So we see the precedent in Acts. And you can go through Acts, and you could, if you want to just do a word search, you could look at baptism and its derivatives. So baptism, baptize. Uh, baptized, and so forth. And you would see that every time a person is saved, they get baptized. So, who needs to be baptized? Well, everyone that wants to obey the commandment that Jesus gave to His disciples. Whereas if you've been saved, you ought to be baptized. All the disciples were baptized. Uh, Jesus Himself was baptized a different type of baptism. He wasn't baptized in the name of Father, Holy, Son, Holy Ghost, but He was baptized with John's baptism, which signified that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and which uh, also demonstrated his obedience to the will of the Father, his identification with his own death, burial, and resurrection. And so baptism is important because why? Well, because God said so. Now stop here just for a minute. Let me talk to you if you haven't been baptized yet. You've believed in Jesus. You've trusted Him as your Savior, but you have not been baptized as a believer. And let me just tell you something. If you haven't been baptized, then you are disobedient to a command of the Scripture. In other words, Jesus said you're supposed to be baptized. And if you haven't been baptized yet, that's your next step. If you haven't been baptized yet, it will be a hindrance to your spiritual growth. In other words, you won't be able to grow beyond uh, obedience. A disobedient Christian does not grow. And so that's the next step for you. That's where you're at this evening. You say, Pastor, if I've received uh, the Word of God. I've, I've believed in Jesus, but I haven't been baptized. That's for you. And that's a matter of a decision for you. You say, hey, Pastor, I need to be baptized. Let me just uh, talk about baptism as well, because some people have these questions. Uh, who baptizes? Uh, usually, uh, we do something that I think is almost unbiblical. I, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to it, but one of the things that we do oftentimes is we baptize people inside the church. We did that last year. We put a baptismal tank over here. And we baptized. It was cold outside. And so we baptized in the church. Well, the way we prefer to do baptism, it really was cold outside too. The way we prefer to do baptism is to go to the ocean, to go to the beach. And we like to go there when there are people at the beach. Why? Well, because 
That's the precedent for baptism. Here in Acts chapter 2, when these believers, they that gladly received His word were baptized, the same day they were added unto them, about 3,000 souls. Those 3,000 people that got baptized did so in front of the very people that screamed crucify Him to the Lord Jesus on the cross. They didn't just get baptized in front of believers. They got baptized in front of Christ haters. And they said, we believe. In other words, their testimony was a bold statement. You know, there are places where people get baptized secretly because it's illegal to be a Christ follower and be a Christian. I don't want to kill anybody. I, I, I hesitate to give advice here. But the testimony of I believe in Jesus is a far more effective one when lost people see it than when they don't. Tertullian put it this way in church history. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And he was talking about people that were Christians who were thrown to the lions in the Roman Colosseum. And every time a single Christian died, ten would walk out of the, out of the stadium in their place saying, that's real. I, if, that, if they have something worth dying for, that's what I want. And literally, the more Christians you killed, the more took his place. You kill one, you got ten. And after a while, Constantine realized you can't beat those odds. And he politicized, made Christianity a religion instead of a relationship with Jesus. Now, listen to me this evening, my friend. The public testimony of baptism is important. I would not here this evening be happy to be responsible for someone undergoing persecution because of baptism. I just think this. I know I'm at a place in my faith that if baptism were a matter for me, I would happily baptize someone in front of anyone for the testimony of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, what if they said it's illegal for you to baptize people? Well, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's right. You know, and so I, 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 uh, someone, I've had people say, Pastor, could I be baptized just you and me in a secret place? And I just had to tell them, you know, being a follower of Jesus is not a secret thing. It's a public thing, and that's what baptism is all about. I hope that makes you think this evening. I'm not particularly concerned tonight if you come to a place of full agreement with me, though the Scripture certainly supports what I just said. In other words, these individuals that got baptized on the day of Pentecost got baptized in front of people that were responsible for crucifying Jesus. And that was dangerous. But that was what they did because baptism is a public identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so I hope that's a help for you with baptism this evening. Uh, please don't come to me this evening then and confess. Don't ever confess this. Don't say, Pastor, I get baptized, but I'm afraid to. <laughs> don't do that, okay? Don't say, oh, I'm afraid to be baptized. I'm, I don't like to be in front of people. Jesus died publicly, was made an open shame. The believers in Acts, who got baptized, got baptized in front of the people who killed Jesus. And if you're embarrassed that other believers who have identified with Jesus would see you or see that you're getting baptized late in life or whatever it is that you think is shameful about it, my friend, baptism is all about not being ashamed of Jesus. Everybody catch that? Okay. All right, let's move on. Uh, then if you're still in Acts chapter 2, I'd like to see something that uh, shows that the apostles understood the Great Commission. Verse 42. Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, the second part of the Great Commission was teaching them to observe all things. And after these believers at Pentecost were baptized in Jerusalem, the Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, doctrine is not a scary word. It simply means teaching. So the, the teaching of the apostles and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. In other words, we see that the apostles taught the new believers to observe all things that the Lord Jesus had commanded them. They fulfilled the Great Commission. And that's a good example for us, isn't it? See, we see instantly the apostles taught them what Jesus said to teach them, their doctrine. That's great, isn't it? It's a good example of that. Uh, let me just, I want to just, uh, before we finish up, we're actually almost finished this evening. Before we finish up looking at this, I'd like to look at a little bit of what the teaching of Jesus was. The things that the apostles would have taught. Now, I can give you a blanket statement and say, read the New Testament of the Scripture. Read what the apostles wrote. That certainly would be the things that Jesus taught. Would it not be? 
Yes, it absolutely would. But let's go to John chapter 13. Before Jesus told the disciples in John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He had told them that he was going to die and uh, that he was going to be put to death on the cross. And when he told them that, he gave them a commandment. Will you look down in John chapter 14 and verse 31? This is after Judas has gone out after being told that he would betray Jesus. Verse 31, Therefore, when he was gone out, speaking of Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Verse 33, Little children, yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come, so now say I to you. Where was Jesus going? Well, he's going to the grave, and then he was going to his father's house. So I cannot, you cannot come there. In verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one another. Now you see where I was going with that? In other words, if we're going to teach them to observe all things that Jesus commanded, one of the first things we ought to teach believers is to love each other. Amen. It's a tragedy when someone comes to know Jesus and they come into the fellowship of believers and they see believers that, where there's friction. The friction is just lack of love. It just is. Uh, you know, as, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't have any reason not to love another brother. You say, Pastor, I do. The reason is what they do. No, the Bible says you're supposed to love them. It doesn't say that they're supposed to do things that make you like them or make you love them. And there's no way in the world a lost world can know that you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ if you don't do what Jesus did, and that's to love people. Did Jesus love people? He was always criticized because he loved sinners, wasn't he? Uh, and sinners are bad, aren't they? You should know. <laughs> sinners are bad. And they do evil things. And Jesus loved them. He, he loved the publicans. He loved sinners. Bad people. Loved them. Why? Well, that's what Jesus did. Um, Pastor, I just hate sin. Good. God hates sin. But Jesus was a friend of sinners. That's what he was called. A friend of sinners. Uh, you know... Last week I heard a man testify. He said, you know, i, I just been really helped this week. Uh, he said, because, he said, I realized that I, I, hate, I hate lost people because they're terrible. He says, and I, I can't hate lost people and win them. Can't win lost people and hate them. You know, that's pretty practical, isn't it? Can you imagine Jesus saying, I just can't stand you. I don't want you, but I'm going to die for you. No. <laughs> Sinners... Always, the sinners never came to Jesus and said, you know, I'm coming and I'm glad you've compromised about this matter of my sin. No, they came to Jesus as sinners and they received forgiveness. But their sin was always called what it was and responded to the way it was. And Christian, I always tell you something, you ought to love sinners. I sometimes have to remind myself that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. And sometimes we as believers, we, we have some fights that are worldly. You know, they're, they're practical. And, uh, you know, so sometimes I mean, we, we have the right in our, in our nation to stand up for things that are constitutionally provided for us. We have freedom of religion in our country. I'm so happy for it. And uh, as a believer, we ought to exercise our right for freedom of religion. You know, you should never be nasty to somebody who tries to persecute you. You should never hate someone. That's kind of tough sometimes. There's some mean, nasty people out there. Aren't there? There are some people that hate you. And Jesus said we're supposed to love them that hate us and bless them that curse us. And uh, that just is contrary to the way we think. But it's one of the things that a believer in Jesus Christ ought to be taught to, live, to, to do, and that's to love others. Christian, hear me now. Hear me tonight. If you are not, if you are not loving other believers you are overlooking something very, very basic in the very things that Jesus told the disciples to teach believers. It's basic. Observe all things. And loving the brethren is basic. 
you should love me, and I should love you, and you should love brothers and sisters. You know, it, it grieves me a little bit sometimes when I find out that people in our church don't even know each other. Sometimes they, I find out people say, you know, they, they'll ask me about somebody that's been coming for a couple of years, and they'll say, uh, when, you know, who's that guy that's been, that, that, that came the other day? I'm like, he's been coming for years. You didn't know that? <laughs> you know, and the, the question that I have is, if you loved him, how would you not know about him? In other words, you love people, you, you care about them, right? You're concerned with their life. I've met people who say, well, you know, I'm just not interested in things they're interested in. We don't have anything in common. Did Jesus say, find things in common? What did he say? That you love one another. In the world, when you love each other, are going to know you're my disciples. How would the world know you're a disciple of Jesus? Well, because that's what Jesus did. And today, my friend, we live in a different generation. The first generation disciples, well, they come a lot, across a lot of people that experience the love of Christ. Personally, I mean, they saw Jesus and what He did. But today, you and I come across people that with their physical eye have not seen Jesus. And so, they aren't going to know what Jesus is like unless we love them. Whereas if somebody knows you don't like them and you preach the gospel to them, like, well, you know, God loves you, I don't. <laughs> uh, if somebody sees that, are they going to have a good understanding of what Jesus is like? No, they're not going to know what it is, and they're not going to know what a disciple of Jesus is like. Uh, there are sets, groups of Christians that take pride in being nasty, fighting, bickering, put, you know, attacking. And my friend, they've never read John 13. They haven't carefully read Matthew 28. Because it's a basic tenet. It's a basic doctrine. It's a basic teaching by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we love one another. Pastor, what about when Jesus, what about when Jesus drove the um, money changers out of the temple? He was cleaning the house. He never said he hated them. He never said he didn't love them. He says, you made my father's house a, a place of, you know, a, of merchandise, a den of thieves. It's a place of merchandise. And uh, he wasn't having that. Jesus never tolerated wickedness, but he, I guarantee he loved the people that he drove out of the temple. Love does not mean compromise. Love does not mean overlooking evil. But love means loving. Here's, here's a principle that I try to apply. Try not to deal with somebody until I deal with them in love. Just a principle. Okay, somebody's done something and, and I have to speak to them. I have to say something. I have to show them mm -hmm. the Word of God. I have to deal with them. I cannot deal with them until I've settled the matter of whether or not I love them. That helps me a great deal. <laughs> it's, I, I hope it will help me more in the future. It's something I'm learning. I can't deal with somebody with the testimony for Jesus Christ without loving them. So, someone's done something evil or wicked and I've got to speak to them, I've got to stand or withstand them. What do I do first? First of all, I deal with the matter of love. You say, Pastor, I can never love that person then never speak to them. You won't do the work of God. You won't do God's work. You get that? Uh, well, I have to speak to Him. I, I'm in that position where you better love Him. See, it's a commandment. And it's basic and it's simple. And I just want to park there this evening. I wanted to just look at some basic commandments that have to do with our knowing God's plan, His work for our lives. You know, sometimes Christians are, we're so concerned about being in the place geographically where God wants us to be. We're so concerned about being in the vocation that God wants us to be in. But while we're worried about you know, these, you know, the calling and the place and our future and, and all these complex uh, things about God's plan for our lives, we overlook the basic things. And it's a sure thing that you can't know the advanced things until you know the fundamental things. Until you're living and applying them. Don't forget about the joy of your salvation. Don't forget that the primary purpose of a disciple is to teach people and to 
teach them to observe all things and to baptize in them and to baptize them. And don't forget that when you teach people to observe all things, it's a good idea to observe the things that you teach. Father, thank you. Thank you tonight for the simplicity of this message. We know it's it's biblical what we've preached this evening, and we know that it's something that we need and oftentimes be reminded of. Help us not to forget it. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. You're dismissed.